My camps is a strange subject. Serious equipment designers tend to dismiss the idea of spending too much time and consideration on a my camp because it's all been done before. There's nothing left to learn. After all, it's just a high gain amplifier designed to get the signal from a microphone up to a suitable volume level so that it can be digitized. Then we can do all sorts of wonderful things to the audio signal. When I started to design and build equipment in the 1960s, we were struggling with understanding how to get the best matching from a microphone to a valve amplifier. Then once transistors were invented, how to achieve minimum noise without the amplifier sounding like a, a, a cheese grater. In the 1980s, or it might have been a bit earlier, integrated circuit designers came up with the designs that gave us good matching from microphones combined with minimum noise and distortion. The integrated circuit type was the SSM2017. Nowadays, there are many similar chips. They all claim to be more suitable or superior in some way. But basically, they're all the same. And, and what's wrong with them? Very little. They're used almost universally. And when used carefully, they, they do the job perfectly. And yet, we all know that some mic amps sound better than others. Back in the 1970s, I experimented with a number of designs of the time for the front end of my 828 mixer. I decided on what was then a conventional and economic design using a shielded microphone transformer and a transistor amplifier with minimum components. At Alice, we, we carried on using a very similar design for the work we then did for the Independent Broadcasting Authority and the BBC. We were all hands-on recording engineers and we realised that our designs did the job and, and sounded good. Later in the mid-1980s, we introduced the 828 Mark II, where I followed convention and used a new amplifier chip. But I, I retained the transformer, probably because, we, <laughs> probably because we built up a stock. The 828 mixer was a huge success, particularly in the independent television production business. They were, they were used all over the world to, to provide good quality location recording with minimal equipment. Productions like The Avengers and The Professionals used them and, and they were rugged and easy to use and could be powered from battery systems common to TV production. But I began to notice comments from engineers and production people that they often tried to use the earlier Mark I versions of the 828 because they sounded better. In those days, we had test equipment that could measure what we thought were the important factors. The noise, the frequency response and the harmonic distortion and the performance of the Mark II was the same or fractionally better than the Mark I in all respects. It was only much later, after the end of the old Alice Company as we knew it, well into the new century, I was working with experiments on the relationship between audio quality and the perception of realism in sound, I started to analyse transient performance. That is, what happens when sudden spikes of sound appear in human ears, but also in amplifiers, and also what various forms of distortion really sound like. At the, at the time, it seemed like a thankless task. Loudspeaker design had advanced hugely and the business seemed to have divided between the, the professionals with their huge studio monitors and the hi-fi fraternity who were, and still are, obsessed with nonsense ideas about low-loss cables and, and damping factors. The actual sound from loudspeakers was, to our ears, invariably messy and unreal. My son Daniel and I worked at the Sound House in Torquay for more than two years developing prototype after prototype of ever more slender and strange looking enclosures, searching for real audio fidelity and being able to measure it with recently acquired digital analysis equipment. Our work on loudspeaker design bore fruit, but 
In addition, I was able to use our results to examine amplifier performance and explain one or two puzzles. The integrated circuit amplifier, particularly a low-level microphone amplifier, is a collection of transistors and diodes connected together to provide perfectly accurate signal amplification. To achieve amplification without distortion, there has to be several internal feedback paths, all controlled to work within volume level limits. In the real world, usable sound has a range of volume levels and amplifiers are designed to accept this range and to allow for overloads of volume. And this is where problems occur. Amplifiers can cater for volume levels up to, say, four or five times the average volume. But what happens when a sharp spike of sound that's more than that appears? This is particularly important in a microphone amplifier where the sound level can vary wildly. As a designer, I, I used to think of this transient overload as just a situation where the amplifier clips and produces a distorted version of the overload spike. But there's more to it than that. When a transient hits, hits an amplifier, all its feedback systems and current controls hit the end stops and cease to function. For a fraction of a second, the amplifier is immobilized and it takes further fractions of a second to get restored to normal operation. So the audio overload is first distorted and then the amplifier takes recovery time to get back to normal operation. Bear in mind, all this is happening in a very short space of time, making it almost inaudible. What does this sound like? It's difficult to generalize, but in many cases, the effect is to sound normal and clean, but at the same time, slightly thin and gravelly. My old mic amp developed for the 828 Mark I works differently. The amplifier relies on feedback to produce distortion-free sound, but it operates in class A, meaning that it has an extended overload margin and zero recovery time. The transformer provides further protection against transients, making it virtually bomb-proof. Consequently, the old Mark I sounds good under a variety of conditions. So, what does all this tell us? <laughs> it does give an explanation why some older equipment sounds better than modern equivalents, even when specifications and test results tell us that they should sound the same. You may well ask the question, why are op-amps, ICs like the TL072, so universally used in professional equipment? Why not use better ones? The answer is that in a mixer, once the signal has got past the mic amp, the dynamic range has already been restricted, so that the volume should never exceed the available overload margin. In that situation, a, a chip like the TL072 quite happily works, just like it says in the spec sheet. As long as it's not pushed too hard, the audio performance will be as good as you can get. A more exotic IC will work perfectly, of course, but no better than our humble TL072. When I say pushed too hard, I mean when the chip is in a circuit that demands more audio gain or amplification that de it's designed for, the effect can be to introduce unwanted harmonics and once again produce a generally unpleasant sound one that we may have been familiar with when using budget equipment. <laughs> Yesterday, I was listening to a lecture given by Rupert Neve 25 years ago. Rupert had some very strict ideas about the relationship of equipment to the perceived friendliness of audio. Rupert, at the time, had a dislike of integrated circuits and CDs. He had strong opinions about extended frequency response and also about distortion factors. He loved good transformers and ultra-low noise transistor amplifiers. I, I didn't know Rupert particularly well, but I met him a few times and 
in the early days of Alice, when I was try, running, trying to run a struggling young company, he was very kind to me. I'm sure that in later years he revised his opinions uh, about CDs and digital sound, but even 30 years ago he was very aware of the psychoacoustic effects of various types of distortion in amplifiers and how we can so easily be misled by test figures. It was known back then about the harshness and discomfort that can be triggered by odd order harmonic overtones, although the extent of the effects are only being realised now, and it's particularly relevant now that loudspeakers have improved so much. When you can hear properly, you can be very much more objective about the failings. Which brings me to a further point about realism of sound. I remember well about 20 years ago wondering how Rupert Neve could have such a strong opinion about frequency response without the backing of some objective proof. What I mean is, he was extolling the virtues of realizable sounds out, of, out to 100 kilohertz, believing that this improved the listening experience. But at the same time, there was no proof of this. It was, it was just the opinion of one or two golden-eared recording engineers. Very recently, in fact, since the death of Rupert Neve, with the advantage of some new technology in loudspeaker design with minimal distortion, we've been able to hear some subtle effects that previously have been masked by the inadequacy of even the very best studio monitors. It's like having a curtain pulled back, exposing subtleties of sound that occurred in the original studio but have been masked ever since. Once again, technical developments are proving to ask more questions than they answer. I've had some middle-of-the-night thoughts on this and uh, I've started to wonder about the way sound is propagated and the way it travels in the air. Why is it that we can never create true realism, even with the finest Atmos listening systems? If we stand in a forest, we can hear our position in the environment. We can try to reproduce this artificially, but the results are a disappointment, no matter how optimistic we are. Binaural reproduction gets us a little closer, but there's still a sensation of realism that's missing. There's no question that our ears have limitations in the frequencies that we're able to hear or even sense, but we can sense spatial realism on a level that's not explained by simple physics of audio technology. Increasingly, I suspect that the linearity of mid to high frequencies in the bandwidth that we can hear is affected or even controlled by the presence of even higher frequencies that are getting reproduced, perhaps largely in the form of harmonics, and at a lower volume level. But they're there nevertheless. I realise that this could well be a vindication of what Rupert believed years ago. An example of this thinking has been during tests on a new sound object listening system, listening to an Atmos rendering of Yellow Brick Road, once the sound objects were placed in the, in the correct relationship with one another and the levels were set, the sound stage appeared to turn solid and tiny details seemed to jump into focus. I suppose it could have been a coincidence or perhaps just a bit of acoustic luck. Anyway, <laughs> research has got to go on. Realism will come one day. <laughs>